Hello again, and welcome to the second attempt at our first Hangout on the Air, produced by Bay Area Bites from KQED. I'm California Report host and reporter Rachel Myro, here with Chuck Siegel of Charles Chaplin. Hi again, Rachel. <laughs> so glad to be here. Tell us again um, a little bit about your history in the Bay Area. You've been making chocolate for 25 years now. I have. Uh, I started my first chocolate company in 1987, Ativo Confections. Uh, that was in Emeryville, and uh, had been really in the chocolate business. With a few years off when I uh, was working for a couple small technology companies, uh, that's what I've been doing my entire adult life. So 25 years of making chocolate. You've never lost your taste for this? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, besides the fact that I mean, I love chocolate. It's truly one of the most exciting, fun foods to eat in all of its different variations in terms of candies, pastries, whatever it is. It's also a lot of fun to work on. And making chocolates and making different things with chocolate is just something I've always loved for. What do you look for uh, when you're tasting chocolate? I imagine for a lot of people, uh, the question is, what does a master palate look for while putting that bit of chocolate in the mouth? Well, I think the thing to remember is, I mean, master palate or not, like all foods, chocolate is subjective. Uh, what I look for in chocolate may not be exactly what you're looking for or anyone else is looking for. Uh, what we want is chocolate that tastes good to us. Now, there are certain things that we should look for in terms of quality, uh, in terms of I mean, where the beans are from, how they're fermented, roasted, and made into chocolate. And that process, uh, like with all foods, is going to determine in large part whether or not it's good or bad. And there are a lot of manufacturers, very large manufacturers, and a lot of small craft manufacturers that are now making chocolate from the beans. I know I have a preference for bittersweet, but I take it from the bowl I'm looking at here that you don't necessarily have a preference between milk chocolate and bittersweet. No, I have a preference for good chocolate. Uh, and to me, what's really important is that we don't focus so much on, oh, it's got to be bittersweet chocolate. Because when you do that, you're really missing a lot of what chocolate can be. Uh, 20 years ago, it was true. Really, most of the best chocolates in the world were bittersweet chocolate. But that's changed, and now most of the manufacturers of really high quality you know, sweet chocolate also make exceptional milk chocolate. And it's a different profile, it can be a little sweeter, but it's every bit as good, especially in terms of the quality, as the bittersweet chocolate. Among the chocolates that you recommended for our home chefs to use as uh, they cook along with us here today um, is Valrona. This is a different uh, brand, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it. Of course. Uh, this is chocolate from a local Bay Area company, Guitar Chocolate Company in Burlingame. And uh, it's a very, very long-established, family-run company that makes fantastic chocolates. And they make chocolates at all different levels. Uh, they have a line called E-Guitar, which is a line of chocolates that are used uh, by a lot of pastry chefs and chocolatiers here in the Bay Area and around the country. Uh, it's a really, really wonderful chocolate. It's uh, well-made. It's consistent. And what I really love about it, besides it being great chocolate, is it takes flavor as well. And for what we do here as chocolatiers, that's really important. We need to be able to use fruits, nuts, herbs, whatever it is that we want to mix into a recipe, knowing that we're going to get a result that where all the flavors work well together. Now, we use a lot of this. We do use a lot of Valrona as well, because for certain recipes, we're looking for different characteristics. We get that from different things. Another uh, pointer for home cooks, if you went ahead and bought bars as opposed to discs, this might be the time to take out, I guess, what, a bread knife and chop them into chunks? I would use a chef's knife uh, because it's heavier and it cuts your chocolate easier. But yeah, when we're making a lot of different recipes, especially this one where we'll be mixing hot cream into the chocolate and using that cream to melt it, having a lot, a lot of surface area makes it uh, more efficient. So we do want to cut the chocolate into smaller pieces before we start. Today we'll be making uh, chocolate truffles, making them out of ganache. I'm wondering if you can recommend some other recipes that uh, the home chef just getting started with chocolate in a serious way might uh, explore. Sure. Uh, what we're going to do in making truffles is make a very basic truffle recipe. And what we'll do as we go along is talk about different ways to change that. And by adding different flavors, whether it's an herbal infusion or even adding a, a jam or a marmalade, 
you can really change the characteristic, get a completely different type of a truffle. And that's one way of kind of expanding kind of your home repertoire. The other thing is making other recipes. Uh, one that I like that's really, really delicious and easy to make is uh, clusters or barks. The, the technique you need to learn is tempering, which actually is not that difficult. And actually, Guitar has a really wonderful home tempering method on their website. I just realized as we were talking. Uh, another is uh, different bakery recipes. Uh, we, a lot of times in cakes and brownies and the like in America, use recipes that call for cocoa powder. And what I recommend is that people start using recipes or even modifying the ones they have to use real chocolate. It changes the flavor, the texture, really makes it something special. What's wrong with cocoa powder? Nothing. Uh, it's just it, you get a different flavor and texture when you use cocoa powder. Uh, also, times a lot in America, we use a Dutch process cocoa, which is a process that allows cocoa to dissolve in liquid much easier. So if you're making a hot drink, it's great. But in a bakery recipe, uh, it's not so much because it doesn't have a lot of the fullness of flavor that unprocessed cocoa has. So when I do use cocoa powder and recommend it, I recommend that you find a natural cocoa powder as opposed to a Dutch cocoa powder. They used another fancy word earlier, tempering. <laughs> Translated into English, that is. Okay, so tempering is not a fancy word. And it's not a fancy process, and it is. It can be really intimidating. And probably of everything we do, it's the most intimidating process. It's the process of conditioning chocolate so that when it hardens, you get that really nice shiny uh, look and a really wonderful texture. Like when you break a bar and it snaps, that means the chocolate's intact. Uh, it's. Something that has to be done in a particular way for the chocolate to be conditioned properly. And that's what can be intimidating. But the reality is, and it's like anything else in the kitchen, even if you get it wrong the first couple times, first you can remelt the chocolate. The chocolate's very forgiving that way. You'll get it, ultimately. And once you learn how to do it, you'll always know. It's a technique like anything else. It's just one of those techniques that's very unique to chocolate, and we're not used to having to deal with it in any other part of the kitchen. Well, with that said, I guess we should get started. Why not? So the recipe that you have online, basically, is for a blend of two chocolates, bittersweet and milk. And that's what we have measured out in the bowl. And then some heavy cream that's brought to a boil. And I've just done that while we've been talking. So here I have some cream. And what we're going to do is we're going to melt the chocolate with the cream. And we do that simply by pouring the cream over the chocolate. And we're just going to let this sit for a few minutes. Not a few minutes. We'll let it sit for about a minute. Now, one of the things about making chocolates at home, a lot of people think you need very particular equipment and things have to be kind of special just for their chocolate making. And nothing could be further from the truth. So what we're going to be making is called a ganache, which is really at its most basic, a blend of chocolate and cream. And to make that ganache, really we're just blending the two. And you can use a lot of different uh, tools to do that. Uh, if you have a spatula, spatulas work really well, whisks work. We're going to be using an immersion blender, which is basically an electric, electric blender that's on a stick. And the reason we're going to be using it is twofold. The first is it's just really fast and efficient, and we don't have all day. Uh, it does a really phenomenal job, and it doesn't mix a lot of extra air into the mix, which is nice. It makes the ganache really good and dense when it, when it firms up. Uh, so it's been sitting for about a minute. Now, whatever tool you use, it's good to start in the middle. So if it's a spatula or a whisk, start stirring in the middle until you see the chocolate and the cream start to come together. And then start moving from the center to the outer edges. So what we're going yeah. to do, once we have this, which is really just the cream and the chocolate, and you can see you want this really beautiful, glossy look to it. Now we're going to add a little bit of butter. And the butter is really just for texture. 
We're going to let that sit in there for a second, and then we're going to blend that in as well. When you say texture, what do you mean? Creaminess. Uh, the way butter hardens, it hardens a little bit differently than this mixture of just plain uh, cream and chocolate. And we're looking for when we eat a truffle or ganache, we want there to be a really wonderful melt on the tongue, and the butter really contributes to that. Now, if you're using a whisk or a spatula at home, you're probably still doing a little bit of work, but that's okay. So now what we want to do is take this ganache that we've made and pour it into a pan to set. And the recipe calls for a 9 by 12 pan. So basically just a brownie pan that's been lined with saran wrap. And lining with saran wrap is really important. Uh, suffice it to say, if you don't, you won't get these out. Uh, so we pour it in. And then we're just going to spread it evenly. And I'm using an offset spatula. You can use a regular spatula. If you have an offset spatula, if you do much cooking, especially baking, the odds are good you might have one of these. We're just going to smooth it out. And then lastly, we're going to fold the saran wrap over it and press it gently into the surface. And basically, you have a pan that's ready to put in the refrigerator. And then these will cool. And what I usually tell people to do is make this before you go to bed, and the next day they'll be ready to cut. Now, since we don't have that much time, I have one here that I made yesterday and put in the refrigerator last night, and it's ready to go. Now, one of the questions that we had was, what if I want to make a smaller batch? What if I don't want to use a 9 by 12 pan? So what I did is I took an 8 inch by 8 inch brownie pan, and I made a smaller one. Now there's two ways of doing this. You can have the recipe, actually not have it. If you do the math, an 8 by 8 pan is essentially 60% of the volume of the 9 by 12. So you take the recipe and basically uh, multiply everything by 0.6, and you'll get the new weights to use uh, for the ingredients. What I did is something a little different. You'll see that when we uh, cut these, they're very small cubes. It was in the photo on uh, the Bay Area Bites page. It was also in uh, the video teaser. Uh, I didn't change the recipe. I actually used a full recipe, and it was to kind of show what would happen when you had a, a thicker piece of ganache and we can cut it into larger cubes. So you're not limited by what I tell you to do with the ganache. You pretty much can do whatever you want. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take the ganache out of the pan very easily. Remove the saran wrap. And basically what we have now is a slab of ganache. And the slab of ganache can be finished in a lot of different ways. The way we make the paves is we cut it into small cubes and we coat it with cocoa powder, and that's what we'll be doing. But again, you don't need to be limited by what we do or what the recipe says to do. You can cut these into small pieces and roll them in your hands to make uh, truffles, ball truffles. And you can coat them in chocolate. You can coat them in cocoa powder then and get a completely different look. Really, uh, you can do whatever you'd like. Now, there's a couple tricks when we're cutting these and we're coating them. One of my favorite tools is a pizza cutter. So we want to cut this into even strips and then cut those strips into cubes. 
There are a couple different tools that you can use. If you happen to have a cheese knife, these work really, really well because you can cut the whole thing a, a strip at a time. Again, regular knives work really well. Um, and if you're cutting with a regular knife, rather than cutting down, you basically just cut across to form the strips. But we're going to use the pizza cutter because, again, it's really quick, it's really easy, and quite frankly, it's kind of fun. And you can do this in a couple different ways. I'm just going to do a free form, but you can even take a ruler and score along each end to get exactly uh, even pieces. So it goes without saying, if you're cutting a whole bunch of small pieces, you get a whole bunch of small pieces. Exactly. If you have big pieces, you have fewer of those. Right. I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, to put gloves on. I didn't do this a minute ago. The reason I'm putting the gloves on isn't necessarily because you have to. Presumably your hands have been washed like ours were before we started. I'm really doing it so I don't have chocolate all over my hands as we're doing this demo. Now this is a little soft because we did take it out of the refrigerator about an hour ago when we were getting set up for the demo. And I'm not going to uh, bore all of you by cutting this entire slab of ganache right now. I'll just cut a few strips. And then instead of using a pizza cutter for the small strips, I'll just use the knife. Again, we're just getting little cubes of ganache that we can coat in cocoa powder. Now, let's talk a little bit about variations while I'm sitting and doing this. We took basically plain cream and poured it over the chocolate. One of the easiest ways to flavor a truffle is to actually flavor the cream. So for example, if you like tea and tea chocolates, you can take that cream and pour it over some uh, tea bags or even some loose tea. Earl Grey works well, peppermint works really well, whatever really you like as a flavor. And you let that milk steep. And then you strain it out, and what you end up with is flavored cream. And that flavored cream is what you use to make the ganache. A real fun one, and kind of one of my favorites, is to use jams. So if you're going to use a jam for, with raspberries or strawberries, it is kind of nice to basically strain it out so you don't have the little seeds. But you do the exact same thing. You take the cream, you put some jam in it, you mix it up, and again, you have a raspberry-flavored ganache uh, when you mix that in with chocolate. And the key is using really great ingredients. If you're going to use good chocolate and you're going to use good cream, you should really make the effort to get uh, some really good jam as well. The key to any kind of good cooking is to remember that everything you use needs to be really exceptional if you want the results to be exceptional. Or kind of the, the kind of philosophy that we use here is the idea that everything we make is equal to the worst ingredient we put into it. And if you think that way, you are always very conscious of the fact that all of your ingredients do make a difference. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw these into the cocoa powder. Now anybody who's visited your shop here in Mission Creek uh, has noticed, it, noticed there aren't ingredients like bacon. <laughs> I'm kind of curious what your feelings are about that. Well, uh, I am something of a classicist. We, we don't use really odd flavors and ingredients in our chocolates because, quite frankly, I don't think they taste good. Uh, now, one thing is this endeavor, Charles Chocolates, because my name is on it, is something of a selfish endeavor. If I don't like it, we don't make it. Uh, there are lots of people out there who like bacon in their chocolate, they like curry, they like wasabi, whatever it is, and, and more power to them. I, quite frankly, just don't find it enjoyable. As a result, we just don't do it. So once we have the squares of ganache and the cocoa powder. You just want to let them get coated evenly. The reason I'm shaking it 
and you can do this all day long and keep adding more and more, is so they don't hit each, touch each other. Uh, they are pretty sticky at this point, and you want to make sure that uh, they don't stick together because they're really just kind of a pain to get apart. So at this point, we're ready to, to get the excess cocoa powder off, put them on a tray, we'll cool them again for about another half hour to firm them up, and then they're ready to eat. We do, however, want to eat them at room temperature. Now, I'm going to use a little sifter just to get the excess cocoa powder off. You don't have to do this. Uh, you can use a colander. You can even use your fingers and just shake them in your fingers. I'm doing this again, quite frankly, because it's quick and it's easy. Now, do you have any uh, tricks to turn this into an easy Halloween treat? One of our community members is, has asked about the upcoming holiday. Absolutely. And, and for Halloween treats, I mean, usually you're talking about something for yourself or for a party. Um, at least here in San Francisco, I know that uh, there's not a lot of uh, Parents, opportunity. Yeah, yeah not, not a lot of opportunity to, to make homemade stuff to give out to the kids anymore. I mean, everything uh, needs to be packaged. The times we live in. Exactly, it is. But there's a lot of different things you can do to kind of make these kind of a fun Halloween treat and even a Christmas treat. Now, a lot of it has to do with flavoring and using different ways of uh, coloring. The chocolates. Uh, actually, I'll take these off now. Can we tip these up? So Absolutely. So they're sticking to the pan, pan pretty well. They are. Uh, they'll roll around. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so what you can do if you're doing something for the holidays is uh, combine it with other ingredients. Uh, whether it's kind of well, I'm a sucker for candy corn. It's always been one of my all-time favorite Halloween candies. And you can do something where you kind of wrap uh, the nacho on it. A uh, piece of candy corn, or even stick one on the top. Do different things like that. I'm not a particular fan of uh, making ganache with, say, fall like squashes or pumpkins or the like. Uh, there are people out there who do that. Again, it's just not something I've been kind of fond of over the years. Uh, so yeah. And what would you do for Christmas while we're at it? While we're at it. <laughs> uh, so with Christmas, one of the most popular flavors we have is mint. So what I would probably do is go out and buy some fresh mint leaves, and you can get at most grocery stores, farmers markets, farmer markets. And again, it's the whole idea of flavoring the ganache by flavoring the cream. So you cook the cream, and as soon as it comes to a boil and you take it off the heat, you take some peppermint leaves, and what you want to do with the leaves is, is chop them up pretty well, because you want to release the oil that's in the leaves, and put it in the cream and let that infuse. Strain it off, and you end up with a really clean, wonderful, fresh mint flavor in your cream. And you then can make a ganache from that. And that's how we make our uh, mint ganache here at Charles Chocolate Day. It's, just, it's very simple, it's very clean, and it's a real classic holiday flavor. Let's see, anything for Hanukkah? Or am I uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, That's a little more difficult. The other thing, by the way, great Christmas recipe, and, and there are a lot of these recipes online. Um, and actually what I'll do is I'll post one on the Charles Chocolates website within the next few days, is peppermint bark. Again, you need to be able to temper chocolate, but again, we've covered that in terms of kind of a skill that's not too hard to master. And then you just need to buy uh, like starlight mints and break them up with a hammer. And you layer uh, some bittersweet chocolate, layer a little white chocolate, and then sprinkle the mint on top. And it is a, an absolute fantastic classic Christmas candy. Well, Chuck, one last question. Um, I understand that some people may be a little confused about your name. You are indeed Chuck Siegel versus Charles Chocolates. Well, it was one of those things when I was uh, starting the company, I was trying to find a name for it. And we do make relatively sophisticated chocolates. And we are kind of a high end artisan chocolatier. Chuck's chocolates just didn't speak to that. Uh, so I was lucky enough that my given name is Charles, and that actually worked beautifully. So uh, while I'm Chuck, the company is Charles, and we are the same person. <laughs> well, Chuck, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Rachel. You've been watching Chuck Siegel of Charles Chocolates make fabulous chocolate truffles. Hopefully you can follow along. We have a community member, a Google Plus community member, who has been following along with us today. And you will find her blog post at kqed.org slash Bay Area Bites. I'm Rachel Myro. Thank you for watching.